My name is Eva Zabe. I'm the executive director of Business for Nature. I'm joined here by a fantastic panel of business leaders. We've got Sven Torre, the CEO of Yara. We've got Marco Bizzari, the CEO of Gucci. Barry Martin on the managing board of Rabobank. Helena Helmerson, the COO of H&M, and Wei Peng, the head of sustainability at Kofco International. Today, we're talking about business leadership in the 2020 super year for nature. And today is a very special day because we are going to be launching our high-level recommendations from business. These are two policymakers. It has never been done before that such a significant group representing business and conservation organizations have come together to unify the business voice and give policymakers the courage and comfort to make really ambitious agreements on nature this year. We're learning from climate in the run-up to the Paris Agreement. And we're hearing over the past few days, the World Economic Forum has released two major reports. First, the Global Risk Report, that tells us that the top five global risks in terms of impact and livelihoods are environmental. And the second major report is called Nature Risk Rising, and it tells us that over half of the world's GDP depends on nature. Businesses are understanding this and are acting. Over 360 companies have already made commitments, public commitments to reverse nature loss, and thousands are taking action in different contexts. But we know that that is not enough. So what we need to do now is to create a positive feedback loop, meaning companies are already taking action, but this needs to be scaled up and it needs to speed up rapidly. And we can do that by building this policy ambition, which in turn will encourage even more positive business action. And that's what we're here today talking about and launching. Over 200 companies engaged with us, with this umbrella organization that is Business for Nature. Over 200 companies from different sectors of different sizes around the world engaged on these high-level policy recommendations. In addition, we have all these credible leaders and organizations that have collectively agreed what these recommendations should be. They're not the end of the journey, they're the beginning of 2020, but we wanted to kick off 2020 with a bang and then say, how can we amplify and then implement these policy rec recommendations throughout the year? So, drum roll. <laughs> Especially those of you on the live webcast, uh, hello to my mother-in-law who's watching. Hi, Janine. <laughs> Are you ready for this? <coughs> Okay, so our top five, and they, as you can see, feature together in a beautiful lotus flower. You probably can't see these, but you do have them in your handouts. So if you saw one of those flyers. To frame these, there are two things to keep in mind of what we were thinking about when we developed these. Number one <laughs> is we need to transform the policy frameworks. But number two is we need to also transform the financial system to recognize and reward the most sustainable companies. So here we have the five petals. Number one, we need to adopt, we're asking for governments to adopt targets to reverse nature loss. Companies need to manage uncertainty. They need to anticipate policy. They need to focus efforts that matter most. So we need to have that direction and the ambition that is driven by governments and world leaders. Number two is we need to align and integrate, but also enforce policies for nature, people, and climate together. It is an integrated 
agenda that we're talking about. Number three is we need to value and embed nature in all of our decision making and in disclosure. That means we need to go beyond short term GD uh, profit and GDP. It means reassessing the way we make decisions and incorporating natural, social, and human capital in those decisions. It means thinking about the task force on climate related financial disclosure and what that means for nature related risks. Number four is we need to reform subsidies and incentive mechanisms. We need to help transition to this just uh, transformation, and finance can help us do that. And number five, we need to join forces for nature. We need to empower those. That means how can we build the capacity and work together? None of us can do this alone, but we can all help reverse loss, nature loss, together. So with that, you have the overall high-level objectives. There's more information online as we just launched. This is the official launch. And I'm absolutely delighted now to turn to our panel and get a sense from you as absolute world leaders in this space. So I'm going to ask you two pretty straightforward questions. Of course, these five policy recommendations fit together beautifully in the lotus flower, and they do work together. But if you had to say, pick one that you would say is particularly relevant and important in your view, which one would you like to pull out? And then also, how about your business leadership in your company? What is an example that's particularly exciting or inspiring where you've shown leadership or you've collaborated on helping reverse nature loss. And we'll go one by one and get your feedback. So starting with you, Sven, um, what do you think is something that one of the policy recommendations that was particularly appealing and what would you like to share? Well, um, thank, th thank you for that. Uh, and I'd like to, to focus on, on, on targets um, here. Uh, and um, just a short while ago, I had um, a discussion with Peter Backer from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, discussing uh, what were they said, the key um, success factors for uh, having the Paris Agreement becoming uh, a reality back in 2015. and and. Um, I think from the business side, this ability to convene and have a collective voice into it was uh, was really important. Uh, now we're uh, heading into the uh, next 12 to 18 months that are incredibly important for uh, for the food and, and, and nature. Uh, and um, we, we, we can have set targets like, uh, say, reverse uh, nature loss by 2030, but behind that, I think it's very important that we we break that down into what does that actually mean. And uh, through my um, role as chair of the of Food and Nature in the World Business Council, I, I think it's key that we, we use this collective business community to drive this down to science-based targets. What does that actually mean for each of the individual businesses so that we can, we can measure that and, and create clear targets? Um, the second part of your question on, on uh, what are we doing? Well, as, as a company, we've actually made a conscious decision that we, we need to reach out. There's only so much that we can do as a, as a crop nutrition company. Uh, we, we need to, to collaborate, and we need to collaborate across the value chain. Uh, we work every day with, with farmers. We see their uh, realities that they are faced with. Uh, it's an incredibly complicated uh, work, and a lot of burden is put on their shoulders to, to solve this. But uh, this is a collective responsibility, I think, starting with the consumers, uh, with the food companies, and then we need to create full value chains. And in that respect, I'm very uh, encouraged by uh, a session I was at yesterday in uh, EVA with uh, uh, this... Um, uh, coalition for um, uh, for um, One Planet Business for Biodiversity, OP2B, that uh, Danone uh, kicked off, but now have uh, Unilever, uh, Nestle is on board, uh, Barry Calibo, uh, McCain. Uh, so, so, so we're starting to create full value chains, and I think that's uh, something that can really make an impact and, and, and very much uh, focused on, on business solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're doing a, a lot of other things as well. We teamed up with IBM to create the uh, traceability to, to, to help farmers to, to, to get access to, to, to data to, to make their everyday lives uh, better. So it's about creating 
say, uh, coalitions and corporations that we, we're not used in historically, but that uh, can solve um, the issues that we're faced with right now. Thanks so much. Excellent. And Wei Peng, over to you in terms of what you want to share. Yes, um, perhaps I'll focus on the second uh, recommendation, which is focusing on policy coherence. Uh, uh, as uh, as, as uh, if I just mentioned, uh, nature, um, people, climate, they simply cannot be viewed in isolation anymore. Um, often uh, that m requires a lot of determination to, bring, to break some existing silos uh, and barriers uh, to bring people who normally don't talk to each other to actually come together and talk and exchange views and re-look at you know, decisions that have already been made previously. But I think at the point, in order to uh, ensure this coherence, it's probably worth the time and uh, the effort to actually to start doing this exercise. Uh, and uh, uh, we feel, um, we, we, we are, our company works in the agriculture space uh, where we uh, vividly uh, observe uh, the impact uh, of uh, of, of nature on, on people, on climate uh, every day. <coughs> talking about uh, the, um, the Amazon uh, forest fires uh, last year, talking about the recent uh, fires in Australia, I think uh, the, the interconnected interconnectivity of uh, nature, climate, and people cannot be overemphasized and can no longer be ignored. So uh, I think the policy coherence, that is absolutely a priority uh, for now, uh, from now going forward. And hopefully that will be uh, heard uh, and, and considered uh, by the policy makers uh, going forward. Thank you. You were also asking uh, about uh, any, any interesting work to share. Uh, actually, at the beginning, in the introduction, you also mentioned about uh, financial system transformation. Uh, I, I think that you know, since Robobank uh, is uh, well represented here, maybe we can highlight that um, uh, we are also doing something similar on traceability, uh, where we are developing uh, traceability to farm level for a lot of commodities that we we source especially the ones that are produced in sensitive regions and, and countries. Um, and then this is something we are determined to do as a company, but we are very happy to get the support and the recognition and to some extent the incentive that you just mentioned that is needed from our uh, stakeholders, including uh, our banks. Uh, we launched a, a sustainability linked loan last year, uh, $2.3 billion, uh, wh which means uh, our whole financial line is now linked to sustainability targets, including traceability targets. And um, our, our banking partners, including Robobank, uh, they were willing to give in uh, a, a chunk of financial returns to reward and recognize their clients for their um, good progress on uh, nature friendly uh, behaviors and, and actions. So I think that shows um, the future direction uh, that we should all hopefully move into uh, and in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with different stakeholders. Um, but I want to emphasize that it's not only the businesses that need support, uh, the ones that really need most support is the parties that actually have that direct interaction with nature, which are the producers and the growers. We, we can never ignore that they are the ones that we should all consider to, to, to find a way to support better. Uh, I think that's hopefully a, a topic that we can explore further together. Thank you Thank so you. much, Wei. And Helena, straight on to you. Right, I would like Thank to you. talk about uh, embedding nature in decision making and also when it comes to uh, disclosure, because I, I guess we all recognize the fact that we need to find ways to kind of decouple our growth with our use of uh, natural resources and that that requires a system change. Uh, and sometimes when we talk about system change, we do it quite lightly, but that actually means that the existing systems cannot be used as such. We have to change them, and then we need a more transformative mindset, where we also take our different roles uh, very kind of seriously. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate to work for a, a kind of a family-run company where long-term has always been more important than short-term gains. But also we have had uh, to kind of redefine performance to some extent. Uh, and uh, I think that one part that has helped us do that is also to find ways to kind of measure where we want to go 
and measure progress, for example, the um, scientific-based uh, climate target to be climate positive by 2040, which is really forcing us to scale up our own uh, commitments and actions, and also the target on uh, only using recycled and sustainably uh, sourced fibers by 2030. So th that's just a few examples where uh, it has kind of pushed us to look at performance and decision making in a different way. But we also see that what we do today in isolation is not good enough. It's simply not creating um, the right impact since we see uh, much more of an urgency. Uh, and that's really why uh, it's very important to also involve policymakers. Um, so I would really like to put emphasis uh, on doing this transformation journey together, uh, where I think it's crucial that governments also with the transformative mindset uh, works on uh, laws and frameworks. And of course, businesses uh, uh, take it seriously and know their value chain so that they can act, commit and collaborate. Uh, Together, I simply think we need to step up in our leadership. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. And over to you, um, Barry. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us as Rubberbank to be able to join uh, this coalition. It's great because we really have to think, right? So uh, <laughs> uh, we are That's done not that easy. <laughs> not that easy. We are not there yet. Well, my topic obviously is subsidies and actually the financial side. Uh, I, I'm a true believer that money makes people tick. <laughs> right, so if you don't don't get the right incentives, you will not do have the right behaviors. Uh, we have seen that in some cases in some um, regions, like in Australia, where water was regulated, and we put price on water, and suddenly you had change of behavior. So people started to look at much better uh, ways, and actually a lot of business cases became possible because you could make your investments in irrigation systems and. Um, and I think the same thing is, is is what's going on right now. I do think that we need to make a we need to price nature properly because as you, uh, nature is just still too cheap for us. Uh, and I think the subsidies and everything should be, re uh, should be reached out uh, exactly to change that behavior. Um, I also would like to say is that we also have to be smarter uh, because uh, the subsidies also have to go to, uh, to calories and nutrition that are more efficient from a point of view of nature. We all know that there are nutritions, nutritious food which are very good and very, uh, let's say, efficient in relation to nature. And we, we actually don't know, and we have not made proper educational uh, processes around that. For us, it's not only the boardroom which is very important, but it's also the whole process around uh, what I call the kitchen table at the farmer. Uh, we have changed a lot about processes. We have one of the things we started to do right now, and we tested it in Brazil, is that when we start a relationship with the client, we actually don't even start talking about the finance we actually start talking about the environmental. Because we have decided now to price our loans actually in, um, in, in a kind of a, a two angles. One, the financial and also the environmental. So, uh, and the reason is that, that if we think that we are starting more and more being able to model in our systems uh, the risk of environment non-compliance. And once you start doing that, you actually can put the price on it. And, and we actually notice is that there is a direct correlation in financial performance and how good the, 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 the farmer is actually doing it on the environmental point of view. So that's why actually you start the angle of the relationship from an environmental point of view, talking about the SDGs, uh, social, how do you go with your workers, how do you deal with your water, how do you deal uh, with your soil. Actually, that actually has a better, uh, let's say, correlation of the success of the relationship on the long term, actually, then you start talking about the finance. So, uh, and you see, it's just the mind shift. And I think as we are sitting here, as you are talking to us, and as you're coming with your, your recommendations, I am a true believer is that once we need to mind shift and we need to put the right pricing on the stuff we are doing. Thank you so much, Barry. And last but not least, Marco. Uh, I thought it was finished. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, listening to all the panelists, I think that um, I'm going to pick the number five because everybody mentioned the collaboration. Mm -hmm. And collaboration, is, I think, is going to become uh, even more key going forward between the same industry and across industries. And collaboration passes through transparency. 
because especially for, for an industry like mine that we were used to hide everything for a long time, especially to keep our creative talent protected mm -hmm. and every source on supply chain, uh, every, I mean, hidden to anybody, today is not possible anymore. And um, um, that's the reason why um, we decided uh, many things. The first one, we, uh, we put together a, a monitoring scheme called the Environmental Profit and Lot that is published on our website. So starting from 2015, you can really see where we are, where we are good at, where we're not good at, where we're working on, etc. And we are sharing that with everybody. I think Francois Ripineau uh, launched uh, uh, recently, and H&M is part of it, um, a fashion pact that thinks something incredible had happened. So like uh, most, approximately 60% of the company, 30% of the companies of the entire fashion system are part of the fashion pact. And fashion pact means act. At the end, so there are stringent objectives that they need to put in place and the targets, size-based targets, etc. Most of them nature-based because most of the solution comes from nature. Um, and, uh, and going to the second part of the question, uh, that is what we are doing as Gucci. Um, we became carbon neutral in 2018 and carbon neutrality today with the technology that we have is completely impossible. For business model like we have, which has been born like 99 years ago, so we have too many suppliers, too many laboratories, it's impossible to be carbon neutral today. Technology is not at the level that we would like to, to be. So we need to do something else, so we decide to offset that, and then you can decide if such offsetting is good, offsetting is not good, but I mean, worse, worse than offsetting is not offsetting at the mm -hmm. end. Because I mean, at, at least we buy, we buy time. And we offset through nature-based solution, try to make sure that the soil is giving back to the, we have the, the eminent professor here, <laughs> um, the, um, to give back to, to all the chain because every starts from there. Um, and why is the Francois Ri decided to gather people in the industry with the fashion path? Uh, I decided to launch something different across industry. So I launched a challenge to other CEOs of the industry and to, to join the forces and to try to mirror what we are doing as Gucci um, and become carbon neutral in offsetting immediately without looking at 2050 targets. Because in 2050, I mean, I'm, th I'm thinking as a businessman, in 2050, it will be 87, okay? So I cannot give me a target as pretending to run in Gucci when I was going to be 87. So I try to have something immediate. And uh, the fact is, in many instances, um, Everybody agrees on this fact. If I talk to CEOs, everybody agrees on the fact that we need to offset, we are carbon neutral, we are net zero, everybody's talking about that. The point is, which is the scope? Scope one and scope two, so offices, shops, everybody can be easily carbon neutral. The problem is the supply chain. That for our industry represent 90% of the impact. So the challenge is very straight. So you need to be scope one, scope two, scope three, you need to have monitor, you need to be certified, you need to be, in any case, investing in technology because the objective is to stop offsetting at a certain point. You need to be really um, carbon neutral. So it's very stringent, so it's not easy for many companies to join. Um, so I, I launched the challenge in November with the flag and tried to run and nobody was following, <laughs> so it's amazing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but two companies joined, uh, The Real Real in, uh, back in December, Lavazza, very recently last week, we're gonna announce other companies uh, coming forward, but it's a, it's a long effort. So I'm here as well to try to uh, share these objectives with everybody, with all the CEOs in the, in the uh, year, because I think it's something that we can do in order to act quicker than anybody else. It doesn't mean that we are not going to continue to invest in the rest and do all the processes, but the technology is not there yet. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And just to, to wrap up this panel, I was just reflecting, listening to this absolute business leadership in this room on this panel and also others in the room. For those of, the, for those of us who have been in this area for a while, when you weren't allowed to say the B word for biodiversity, <laughs> um, here we are talking about systems transformation, redefining what performance looks like. We're talking about full supply chain transparency and collaborating through your value chains and showing the way by holding the flag and asking those to run behind. It is unbelievable and I am incredibly excited that here we are today in this room launching 
our high-level policy recommendations. At the same time, there are conversations and people spending protocol, um, prototyping workshops, trying to hash out what these targets will be. We're basing all of this information on science, and we will make nature that much more material and that much more visible for companies very quickly, and it starts in this 2020 super year. So with that, I'd like to thank this panel very much with a warm hand. Thank you. And I, uh, we, time's up already. We had so much fun <laughs> for the panel bit, but we will continue now rolling up our sleeves, going into a working session. So please... Round of applause as we, uh, as our panelists leave, leave the stage once more. Thank you so much. <laughs>